good evening, everybody. Um, well, my name is Claire Fox, and I'm the director of the Institute of Ideas, and I'd like to welcome you to this uh, special uh, Christmas lecture for the Institute of Ideas. Uh, just by way of starting, I just wanted to note, uh, as we end the year, that it's been a long and interesting and challenging time for the Institute of Ideas over the last year. I think largely successful. Um, we carried on expanding the Debating Matters competition that runs now for six formers throughout the UK um, and is a competition that's based on substance, not style, and also has now expanded throughout India. And we hope, as we move into the new year, to um, expand it further and also hopefully move into other countries. Um, that sounds like we're imperialist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're talking over the world. Um, we started off the year very well by um, having, uh, and we were delighted to get a Welcome Trust Strategic Award for Debating Matters to help us take the competition forward, which we considered to be a great honour and was a good start to the year. We've also, of course, continued um, with the Battle of Ideas this year, um, uh, I think particularly successful festival at getting to grips with some of the key issues of our time and expanded that program again throughout the UK through the Battle Satellite program and increasingly internationally in fact Angus Kennedy has kind of moved us uh, into Europe in that way and we hope for 2012 very much that the Battle of Ideas will be seen as a European uh, festival of ideas uh, um, and as it expands outwards. We've also uh, this year launched the Academy uh, a modest attempt at self-education in terms of going away uh, for a couple of hundred of us to actually try and get to grips with um, some of the key academic uh, ideas, knowledge of <coughs> 2,000 years worth of knowledge, looking at classics and history, this year literature as well, and to try and see if we could move away from the more instrumental approach to knowledge and education that exists in the world. It was a pilot this year. We, we are uh, starting uh, doing it again next year uh, in, in July, and I hope that many of you will come along. And the details for next year's academy are here. Just say, in order to come to the academy, though, you have to be a member of the Institute of Ideas. Um, and so, I'd of course like to urge you all to join the Institute of Ideas. I'd like to thank those of you who supported us through this year. Um, we really couldn't uh, survive without you. Um, for those of you who aren't members, it's time to join. I hope that you'll feel uh, that that's something that you want to do because we really need your money and your support. I am trying to avoid the kind of Eurozone begging bowl approach, uh, but money is a factor uh, in the real world. So if you kind of like the kind of things we're up to, then please uh, put your money where your mouth is. And when I say join, I am trying to avoid the kind of EU Merkel join or else approach as well. I'm hoping that you'll be convinced both politically and intellectually, that you want to voluntarily join the Institute of Ideas because of what you think we're doing in terms of deepening public debate, not running shy of controversy, being prepared to challenge each other and think and say the unthinkable and unsayable um, is actually something that appeals to you. So it's in that spirit that we have this evening's uh, Institute of Ideas lecture with three mini lecturers. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Angus Kennedy, who's going to uh, uh, introduce it. He runs our economy forum and uh, multitasks and does a million other things. But we uh, inevitably think that this question is a key one for our time, and we're delighted to have the speakers uh, to address it and Angus to introduce it. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank, thanks, Derek. So, yes, I'm Angus Kennedy and I run the Institute of Ideas Economy Forum, um, in which we kind of came up with the idea of doing this. Um, we managed to notice what was going on uh, around us in the world, but <laughs> there might be good timing to discuss it uh, at the moment. Um, I just wanted to start with a couple of quotes that I put on um, the website uh, in our kind of <clears throat> blurb essay about the reasons for doing this. One's from Angela Merkel. Uh, and this is kind of good news for Christmas part. <clears throat> no one should take it for granted that there will be peace and affluence in Europe in the next half century. Mm -hmm. And if that wasn't bad enough, uh, an anonymous EU official, only those Europeans in their late 80s will have any idea about how bad it could get. <laughs> so <clears throat> clearly somebody wants us to be very scared about what's going on. Uh, so I had a look to see if we could find any kind of bad tidings uh, at this time of year. Uh, after the summit 
uh, in Brussels last Friday. Well, the good news is for those of us who still have uh, pounds in our pockets, if you're going on holiday uh, in Euroland this Christmas, you get more for your pound. Uh, I think it's one uh, euro 20 cents uh, today. Uh, it's slumped again. Uh, the FTSE was up for a bit, uh, while Eurozone shares were down. Uh, it's been sort of Merry Christmas for uh, David Cameron. 62% of people polled in the UK support his veto. 66% uh, of us apparently want a referendum, and 48% of us want out of Europe, so that's a happy Christmas uh, for Eurosceptics among us. And it's been a Frolika Weinart to uh, for Angela Merkel, apparently, uh, who said yesterday that last week's summit had secured the long-term future of the single currency and European political union. <coughs> so it can only really be sour grapes on the part of uh, her uh, opposition leaders in the German SDP, who said yesterday that the fiscal pact is only an illusory giant, and that what was once a banking crisis uh, has morphed into a sovereign debt crisis and is now a full-blown constitutional crisis. But at least it must be a Joyeux uh, Noël for uh, President Sarkozy. He's been uh, walking the talk uh, of a very grown-up statesman today, calling Cameron an obstinate kid. And I thought this was, was quoting, uh, worth quoting at, at, at length. He, he was talking to his MPs yesterday about what he describes as his coup. And he said, it's the first time that we have said no to the English. Objectively, it was a good coup. I maneuvered well. The whole world recognized that my proposal was the only possible course. It's kind of a, a brand moment there. <laughs> and this accord, this is a little bit, bit of a downbeat note, the accord will perhaps not put an end to the crisis, but it is a tool for facing up to it. <clears throat> That's all right, then. Uh, the dynamism of the Franco-German axis enabled us to rally 26 countries. Well, it's not 26 now that it's one day later, because the Swedes, the Czechs, the Poles, the Hungarians, the Dutch, the Irish, the Finns, and the Danes are all not quite so sure uh, anymore about the deal that was signed only last Friday. And a lot of very serious economic commentators this, in this very long <coughs> week have been pointing out that maybe not everything is uh, particularly rosy. Simon Nixon, uh, just on Monday, uh, made the point in an article that neither Cameron, nor Sarkozy, nor Merkel got what they wanted at the summit. No, but there's no expanded role for the European Central Bank, no 27-wide treaty on fiscal discipline. Arguably, they've all failed uh, to get what they wanted at this summit. This summit is the eighth, uh, save the Eurozone uh, summit this year. And all it is really agreed, I would argue, is to come back in another three months and try again. It looks to me like more of the same, a monomaniacal obsession on austerity and no real plan to kickstart the economic growth that a lot of economists are arguing is absolutely essential. Uh, Mark Wolf in the FT just uh, this Tuesday dubbed the pact an instability and stagnation union, uh, pointing out that there was no deal on fiscal, financial or political union and that the only uh, likely outcome was austerity <coughs> across Europe, wage falls, debt deflation, and slump. And he managed to raise the question, which I think we should all be thinking about tonight, the once unthinkable question, if austerity is the only thing on the table, maybe it would be better to leave. And that's Martin Wolf. <clears throat> and that question, the unthinkable question, is the kind of question we like uh, at the Institute of Ideas, uh, and what we're going to explore tonight. Uh, what lies ahead, broadly, uh, for Europe, how did we get here in this crisis, and what does it mean uh, us for us Europeans? I want to look at the broad trends, uh, and our lecturers uh, will do that. So I think just to introduce them, the way it's going to work is that they will all give a lecture uh, each uh, for 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll have a quick discussion uh, up here uh, between us, and then very quickly go out to you for questions and points so we can broaden out the discussion <coughs> and see what we uh, make of it. I think we've been very, very lucky to get our three lecturers this evening. I'm very grateful that they've turned out, uh, and very grateful you've all turned out tonight. Uh, I know it's the sort of second last, ultimate Thursday before Christmas, is it? So <clears throat> we will go to the pub later on, I promise. But in the order that they're going to talk to us tonight, uh, Simon Nixon uh, in the middle is going to talk for lecture first. He's the European editor of uh, Wall Street's journal, uh, Heard on the Street column. Uh, he's a prolific Twitterer. I recommend you follow him. I have been uh, over the last week 
Uh, I found everything he said very interesting uh, and illuminating about what's going on. Uh, he was a historian originally, an investment banker, please don't hold that against him, uh, a, a journalist. He's given up of his time to Kyle Stein because he's not feeling too well, up on the colds that are going around, uh, but I'm sure he'll be very interesting. We can clap them all at the end, I'll just introduce them all first. Oh, I should say as well that um, there's a bookshop over there which is uh, 10% off uh, tonight in the spirit of uh, Christmas, and Mark's book, uh, Simon's book is there as well. Um, called The Credit Crunch, How Safe Is Your Money? Um, how safe is it these days? Not that safe when it was written three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but still a very good read. <coughs> Second intellectual will be Mark Seddon, uh, just on my left here. Uh, Mark's been a journalist for 20 years, uh, interviewed uh, everyone from Michael Foote to Tony Blair, George Clooney to Lech Valenza. Uh, he was editor of Tribune uh, from 1993 to 2004. He joined the Labour Party at age 15, which I guess makes him a kind of Labour Party William Hay. Um, <laughs> if that's all right to say. <laughs> but he was on Labour's National Executive Committee for eight years and was really the uh, focal point of resistance there to Tony Blair and the war in Iraq, which makes him a kind of a rare thing in the Labour Party of like a, a principal politician. Uh, he's written a book about it called Standing for Something, uh, Life in the Awkward Squad, squad which is very good, very funny. <coughs> and. Uh, over there, been sent off uh, tonight. And he's also an advisor, formerly the director actually, of the People's Pledge campaign, uh, which is a campaign to uh, back MPs who are prepared to support a referendum, uh, an in out question uh, a referendum on Europe, which makes Mark uh, not only principled in his politics, but a committed uh, Democrat and a kind of left Eurosceptic as well, which means it's great to have you on the panel tonight, Mark. And third to lecture will be uh, Phil Mullen. Uh, Phil's an economist. He's the part-time business transformation director at EasyNet Global Services. I think that means he works part-time, whether he does part-time transformation. Um, <laughs> his book, The uh, Imaginary Time Bomb, uh, about the uh, social democratic changes in pensions, is over there too. But more importantly, maybe Phil's writing a new book about what the limits are uh, to the muddling through the summit after su summit, the delay. Uh, the reckoning with the economic crisis <clears throat> that we're seeing in Europe, uh, examining what the limits might be uh, and where we might run up against them, because that uh, kick the can down the road approach to these problems uh, can't work forever. So can we give all, all our uh, lecturers a big round of applause? <laughs> Finally, in terms of housekeeping, um, if you turn your mobile phones on the silent, that would be good. You can keep them on if you want to Twitter, uh, which, whether you're using a hashtag IOI, which unfortunately looks like laugh out loud, but <laughs> go with it, IOI, and hashtag Eurozone if you've got room uh, for that as well. But that's uh, it for me, Simon. <coughs> Thanks very much, Angus, and uh, thank you very much for having me too. This is my fourth time I've spoken to the Institute of Ideas and Tech, and I would say that I always uh, take as much away from it as I, hopefully I can share. So I always really appreciate um, coming here and uh, amazed to see so many people on a cold Thursday night before Christmas. Um, this is going to be the Christmas in Eurozone, so I thought that um, the simple thing to do would just be to tell a Christmas fable. Um, and uh, how better, what better than a, an updated version of The Christmas Carol. Um, and uh, so let's think about um, uh, old Merkel's ghost visiting Scrooge or Sarkozy or everyone uh, just before Christmas. And, uh, um, and you, know the, you know the plot. So the ghost of Christmas past, start with the ghost of Christmas past, past and uh, and we start first to go and look at Germany uh, a couple of years, um, you know, three years ago, just before the start of the financial crisis. Um, and uh, imagine a Mercedes factory, people working extremely hard, uh, slightly disgruntled because they've had to work longer hours than in the past because of union reforms. Uh, they're being paid a little bit, they haven't had a pay rise for a few years. Um, uh, their, their retirement ages have been pushed forward. Um, but they go home and they don't spend very much money, they save a lot and they put their money into the German banking system. <coughs> we look across the continent to Greece 
and uh, and there maybe we see some uh, young glamorous people um, around the swimming pool having some fun. They're uh, they're actually retired. Uh, they're from one of the several uh, one of the hundred or so industries that uh, allow you to retire very early in Greece because of their unique hardship. They may be hairdressers or train drivers or something but in the past life. Or maybe they work for the Greek public sector, where um, you know there are a lot, where there are uh, where an enormous number of, uh, where one million of one million people in a country of 30 million people working for the public sector, um, and uh, and in the, in the drive maybe a Mercedes, and uh, all of this paid for with uh, government money that's come into their bank accounts, which of course have been borrowed from those German banks, and I think you know, the point of Christmas past is that. At the heart of is to make the point that at the heart of this crisis is a competitiveness crisis, and that we can't really think about the eurozone crisis without understanding that over the course of the era of the of the euro's existence, we've, we uh, the most extreme imbalance has built up throughout the eurozone, as um, the the countries in the south of Europe and periphery. Uh, who uh, joined the euro didn't uh, rather, rather than reforming their economies in the way that Germany had hoped they would. Germany thought that the euro was a once in a lifetime opportunity for them to become more like Germany, uh, whereas the countries of the uh, many of the countries in Europe saw it as a once in a lifetime opportunity to borrow at very very cheap rates and to enjoy all the trappings that came with that. And uh, you know, and, and so each different country. All of these different countries found different ways to, to borrow, to mask their lack of competitiveness, uh, whether it was uh, housing bubbles in Spain and Ireland or uh, expansions of the public sector in Greece and in Portugal. And what happened was that they, actually over the course of those 10 years, the, uh, the wages of these countries relative to Germany went from about 20% below Germany um, to about 30% above in the course of a decade. So at the heart of this is a competitiveness crisis, and that's what one has to try and now unwind. Going forward to the ghost of Christmas present, and we go back to the Mercedes factory in Germany. And my goodness, they're busy. They've never been busier. They, uh, the work is still coming in. The, uh, the, the German unemployment over the course of the last three years of the financial crisis, German unemployment has actually fallen. GDP is higher than it was at the start of the financial crisis. Um, the, um, the, so the, the workers, the people, the people of Germany are still uh, earning very good money, of course the borrowing rates are very low, and they're still putting, they're still not spending their money, they're still putting it in the banks, but those banks of course are now under enormous strain, uh, with a big capital hole. And then we go to Greece, and still the, uh, and, and the same, and, the, and, the, and there of course the situation is very different, because uh, the pensions are still being paid, and the public sector is still being paid, very few public sector jobs have been lost. But the, uh, despite all the austerity, but you know wages have fallen, um, and many of these families now are having to support younger members of the family. Unemployment's very high. Uh, there's um, the, in the private sector, lots of jobs have been lost. Um, you know, the swimming pool probably has a cover over it now to avoid the tax man in his helicopter, who's now got a tax on on swimming pools. Uh, anyone who's got any money has put it offshore, taken it out of the banking system, so the banks can't lend. Um, and, uh, and, and people have been putting their money into anything that's mobile, so there's a, big, there's a lot of yachts and ships are being sold in Greece, so people can, if, they, if necessary, get their money out of the country. So that's a country that's in, uh, you know, and, and of course is relying, in, relying entirely on every three months on another IMF check. Um, meanwhile, the goes to Christmas present, we can look into the offices of David Cameron, Sarkozy, Merkel, and we can see them even today on the phone to each other, desperately trying to sort out the disaster of last week's summit. Because, as Angus said, none of them got what they wanted. This um, uh, Sarkozy wanted the ECB to come in and uh, unleash its firepower on the sovereign debt crisis. The Germans wanted. Uh, a fiscal union that would be enforced through all 27 countries through the institutions of the EU and the UK wanted some kind of special <coughs> exemption for the city. None of them got what they wanted. The, uh, the, the Euro crisis continues essentially to found... Uh, and what, I suppose what, I suppose the point of here is that the, 
the message of the, of the ghost of Christmas present here is that this isn't really just a, a, a debt crisis, this is a competitiveness crisis, a, a governance crisis too. That the, there's a crisis of governance within the countries of the Eurozone where uh, individual countries fail to reform their economies even as they were being bailed out by the IMF and the EU. And that has been a, a, a major <coughs> sticking point, the moral hazard issue. How on earth do you get these countries to reform and, uh, in a way that enables the, them to become competitive again? And then there's a, and there's a governance issue between the countries of the EU, within the EU itself. How do you solve this moral hazard problem in terms of the EU institutions? How can you create the conditions for the ECB or a euro bond if you can't trust the countries who are going to get advantage of the cheap borrowing not to carry on spending in the future? And these are very, very difficult questions. And at the heart of this governance issue at EU level, there's this thing very, very different philosophy between France and Germany in particular. I was in Brussels the other day, and one of the senior members of the Commission was saying to me that, with exasperation, that at every single step of the way over the last three years, France and Germany haven't seen eye to eye on a single issue. And that's been a problem all the way through, that France is a country with you know, four or five hundred years of history as a centralized, powerful state, where Paris's writ runs through the whole country. Germany is a more, you know, more, uh, more modern creation, it's a federal country. And they know, and in Germany, they, the German model works because they have clear rules between the relationship between the state and the center. And so Germany is much more happy and comfortable with the idea of supranational powers. Um, with handing sovereignty to a supranational authority with rules and discipline between the members. Whereas France, uh, for that, but for France, a proud, independent nation for all these hundred years, that's absolutely anathema, the idea that you would hand your sovereignty to Brussels bureaucrats. So, uh, and so at, the heart of, so at the heart of the Eurozone crisis is fundamental philosophical difference between France and Germany. And into that mix, the other day, obviously, exposedly, was came David Cameron with the UK suddenly being asked to give its consent to a treaty change that would have enabled the governance issue to be addressed at the EU level. Uh, but of course that required the UK's consent. And the UK has a altogether very different philosophy to both France and Germany. So the three great biggest powers in Europe are totally at loggerheads. So just skipping forward to the ghost of Christmas future. Well really, the um, I could show you any Anything you, I can show you any uh, picture of misery that you could want to imagine here. There is, there are, you know, if, if I wanted to terrify you, I could show you um, a Greece in a year or two, you know, all these Eurozone countries, Greece again in a couple of years' time, still under the yoke of austerity. Its economy, you know, uh, unemployment rising, the debt burden becoming ever further away, still reliant on bailout money from other countries, you know, uh, would still with, if not technocratic governments, you know, maybe an elected government that's still forced to do the same things as the technocratic government, you know, that just uh, absolutely, uh, you know, with social unrest rising, with, uh, with um, unemployment rising, uh, and this, this could be the same, uh, businesses, uh, businesses failing, uh, and banks being unable to lend. Um, and, uh, and then, I could, then we, and we could see this repeated all across the Eurozone. Just uh, you know, stagnation um, of uh, of foreign com foreign companies putting their money up. We've already seen that already from the banking system. We've seen all over Europe that Americans have pulled out their dollars. Uh, that foreign companies don't want to put money into European banks. Um, you know, businesses are scared to put, invest in the eurozone right now. Everybody's worried about the collapse. If there's a collapse, and what that would mean, how they can protect their interests, what they should be, you know, what they should, how they should be protecting themselves. So. This could carry on for, a, for quite some time. And then what if the Eurozone does collapse? Uh, what, if, what, if that, what if that is the, is the outcome? Well, you could be, it, will, it, would be, it would be unthinkable. It would be an unimaginable disaster. The, um, uh, there is no doubt that, I mean, that there is no roadmap for how this could be achieved. There is no legal way of doing this. It would be a legal nightmare. Uh, you would, you know, if, uh, if Greece was to pull out of the Eurozone, then immediately, its government would be unable to fund itself, its banks would be unable to fund themselves, you would see um, major financial collapse there. Uh, and if 
they would immediately, they through contagion, you'd like to see bank runs across the rest of the Eurozone. It would be incredibly hard once one country left the Eurozone to actually keep the rest of it together. They would all start falling one by one, and probably very rapidly. So uh, it would be, and, and in the meantime, there would be a legal nightmare, because every single Euro contract around the world would have to be, would then be up for grabs. Is it a drachma contract or a lira contract? Everybody who had Everybody who had any euros at all would claim they were Deutschmarks, and anyone who owed any euros at all would say they were drachma. Nobody would want to. Uh, it would be very so. It would be a uh, and this if if they're still now even now trying to work out and unravel the Lehman bankruptcy, who owes who what. Imagine trying to unravel the single currency of 17 countries. This would be it would be a uh, a very very um, uh, difficult time for the whole world, and who knows where that would lead to. So what happened in the story when, uh, when, uh, when Mercosi woke up on Christmas Day? Uh, well, maybe Mercosi woke up on Christmas Day and maybe, uh, and maybe having seen the terror of Christmas future, uh, Germany agreed to allow the ECB to start funding, um, to start funding the sovereign debt, uh, sovereign debt markets. Maybe France agreed to allow a proper fiscal union uh, through the Treaty of 27, and maybe France and, Germ and, maybe France and Germany agreed to, uh, to ha leave their hands off the city so that David Cameron could give his blessing to the treaty change. And maybe, um, and maybe referenda would take place all across the Eurozone and a jubilant people would vote willingly for this new European Union uh, and this um, and this new uh, and and confidence would return. And businesses would start to uh, invest again, and uh, the markets would reopen and uh, harmony restored. And the and in the Mercedes factory, they would still carry on, say, put, putting their money into German banks. And the um, and in Greece, they would uh, uh, continue, they would take the covers off the swimming pools and happily pay the tax to the tax man. <laughs> and, uh, and and they say harmony groups all. Uh, what? Um, but of course, uh, what do I think on this? Well, I have to say, my head says that uh, intellectually I can't see it happening. But maybe it's a, something to do with human nature. But somehow in my heart, I cannot quite believe that will really allow this. Uh, that will allow this to uh, this, this this nightmare scenario to unravel. But uh, as I say, intellectually, it's very hard to see how it can be avoided. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Angus. Um, thank you very much also to the Institute of uh, Ideas. Uh, I, I'm not a technocrat, and I don't think any of us are technocrats, so we're all on borrowed time, I suspect. <laughs> uh, next year we'll be all replaced when we. <laughs> Institute of Directors eats up the Institute of Ideas. <laughs> Everybody will be appointed for their expertise. I'm not an expert. I mean, but I, should, I come with a health warning. I've, I've always been something of a Eurosceptic. It sort of waxed and waned with the passage of time. As, was, as Angus said, it's up for some bizarre reason, possibly it's uh, deeply psychologically rooted or whatever, coming from a, a right-wing conservative family. I joined the Labour Party when I was 15, uh, and but perversely fell in with the, something called the Anti-Common Market League. Um, now, these, they had some concerns back in the 70s. They were very concerned that the common market that Britain had just joined um, was essentially going to sort of take trade away from traditional areas, and Britain would uh, throw in its lock with uh, Europe and, uh, and turn its back on the Commonwealth. These are sorts of ideas that have been banded around at the time. I mean, look, the, the thing has, has moved and changed massively since that time, and since there was last a referendum on it, which was back in 1975. Now, I'm also old enough to remember um, when Thatcher was in power, uh, that uh, things looked so desperate for the British left and for trade unions uh, in Britain at a time of uh, rising unemployment. But when Jacques Delors came along uh, with his idea of a social Europe and a social chapter, uh, the left, uh, not only in Britain but over the rest of Europe, reached out and grabbed it and said, this is the best we can possibly hope for. We can't change right-wing governments in Britain. This is really what we must hope for. This is the best we can hope for. 
Uh, and it's very interesting, actually, to see the passage of time now, that same man, the great, the man who essentially changed the, the, uh, the view very much of the labor movement at the time, uh, it, from being quite Eurosceptical and for voting no in the common market re referendum to becoming a pro-EU party and trade union movement, Jacques Delors, is now saying, well, actually, the whole Eurozone, uh, the whole single currency, uh, has been, uh, was built in, in entirely the wrong way and was bound to fail. So the great guru that many of us were looking to to save us back then is now telling us something entirely different. And clearly, he has a point. Now, back when Labour was in power, not all that long ago, I, I remember there was a great push from all sorts of very bright people saying, Britain really should join the single currency. You know, we'd be very foolish to stay out of this. Um, and anybody who disagreed with it really was a sort of little Englander, uh, didn't know what they're talking about, and uh, was reactionary and all the rest of it. And I remember listening to people like Tony Blair and Peter Mandelson and Leon Britton and Michael <coughs> Gardy and staff and all the rest of it. And something kicked in, you know, it's a, it was kind of an immediate reaction. I'm not an economist, but I was, I was immediately suspicious. Uh, if this lot were in favour of it, there's probably a bloody good reason to be against it. And frankly, those reasons did become more apparent to this non-economist. For some bizarre reason, um, I was put on something called the, um, the Labour Party's Economic Policy Commission. And if I could remember the day and get, 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 go to the right place, uh, we would meet with uh, Gordon Brown to apparently decide what Labour Party's policy, economic policies were. Uh, and uh, this, some of us tried to do, occasionally trying to force the odd vote and what have you. But one thing we did, I think, managed to do, some of us, is help stiffen the resolve of Gordon Brown, for probably just the same reasons that we were opposed to the single currency, because it was all in favour of uh, Blair and Mandelson and others. Uh, uh, he came up, of course, with the five tests, I think it was, wasn't it? The five tests for joining the single currency, which fortunately uh, we, never, we never met. So there we are, we, have, we, we remain out of the single currency, uh, and we see what's happening before us. And what I really, really don't understand is that watching uh, things unfold at the speed they are, uh, that there isn't a massive public outcry, uh, not just here in Britain, but elsewhere in Europe, at the way decisions are being key, uh, economic decisions are being decided. They always have to a degree, as we know. They, the word directive, you know, there is a directive on competition policy. There is a directive on trade policy. There is this desire, really, to centralise economic planning, but not in, a, in an old Marxist way, but I would argue in a kind of sort of neoliberal way, with a few crumbs thrown out at the side. And that was the social chapter. But we see um, this move towards uh, rule by technocrats, unappointed people. We've seen, this is not, this is, I don't believe in conspiracies, by the way. I do genuinely think it's usually cock-up more than conspiracy. And clearly, there have been some massive cock-ups uh, in, in the European Union and in the Eurozone. But what is it? I mean, Angus and I were just talking about this earlier. I mean, the, the, the left and democratic forces of Italy have spent years trying to get rid of Silvio Berlusconi. And he went overnight. There was a bunch of people in Brussels decided he should go, and he was replaced by somebody who had never been elected, and by a government that had been, never been elected. When the Greeks had the temerity to talk about having a referendum, the same happened there. An elected government was just thrown out. It's just truly astonishing. And I just look to the, to the usual places where I would hope to see some absolute sense of outrage uh, on, on the left and elsewhere, saying, this is democracy being betrayed. You know, we keep on being patronised in a way. Um, I think that we're probably all very good Europeans. You know, we're all good Europeans, but we're constantly told that if we don't agree with the latest Euro directive or the latest decision being taken in the Eurozone, somehow everything's going to break up and we will find ourselves back at the sort of beginning of the First World War or the Second World War. Something we're all going to fall out of <coughs> and start fighting. Utter, utter patronising nonsense. So, but what, so we're not able really now to ask fundamental questions and we're being told the sort of political leaders and the sort of economic policies we have to have in near perpetuity. <coughs> and you have to stand back too and think that it has taken centuries to uh, fight for democracy, a representative democracy, <coughs> right across the world. 
and that it wasn't all that long ago that actually there was dictatorship in many parts of Europe. Not long at all. I mean, it was just back in the 80s, half of Central and Eastern Europe was under communist rule. Not that long ago, really, that Spain and Portugal were under fascist rule. Not that long ago either that Germany and Italy were as well. And I'm not saying that these are the forces that are being lined up now, but you can see that this new authoritarianism in a time of deep crisis, deep austerity, could uh, rise again. So do you know what, when, bizarrely, when, Cam when I watched all this stuff last week and I saw, uh, you know, again, the, the parochialism of so much of the British media, um, sometimes the damning, you know, you have to choose between the Express or the Guardian sometimes, and there's, no, there's nothing in between. It's not, it's not, I mean, this is why this is so good, I think, because I think we will get some intelligence coming out of this, because frankly, the idea that you're either with the Express or the Guardian, you're either in or you're out, and you can't stand back and say, well, hold on, you know, just as, as Simon was saying, look at what was decided last week. It does appear, again, I'm not a technocrat, but it does appear there was an attempt to bounce a new treaty through. This was a pre-agreement about a, a new treaty, I think. I, and I think also that if it had been a new treaty being decided there and then, there probably would have had to be referendums, especially in countries like Ireland. And I can't believe the Euro political class would have wanted that. So I found myself, oddly, in for the first time in my life, not in complete agreement with Cameron, because I think that the City of London should be taxed. And I think that some of the recommendations, and I think the Vickers uh, report, are probably tougher than what the Europeans were recommending, which is very interesting. I'm all in favour of a Tobin tax. Of course, it's easy to say we, I'd much prefer to have one internationally agreed. Well, yeah, like Kyoto, it can come about. I'm all in favour of, we should all be in favour of international agreements. Um, but I'm not sure that I thought that it was a particularly good idea to be bounced by President Sarkozy into a banking tax, essentially, as I could see, to take money from the City of London to help prop up the Eurozone. I think that's what it was about. So I don't entirely blame Cameron for doing what he's doing, or what he did. And I was, I'm still looking, I'm still looking for the left democratic response, or at least the democratic response, or at least the liberal democratic response. Oh, forget the liberal democratic. <laughs> you should forget the <coughs> What a waste of time. And as for Nick Clegg, I mean, the other thing I would say, I mean, the, the other slightly, you know, sometimes when you begin to doubt and you think, well, perhaps they've got a point, out come Paddy Ashdown, Nick Clegg, <laughs> Peter Manson, all of these people patronising us, forgetting to forgetting to be picked up by lazy journalists on their total support for <coughs> most of these mad things that have come about over the past few years, uh, and are not really facing up to the reality. And I think, <coughs> essentially, it's something we do have to face up to, that many of the people who were behind the idea of a single currency were quite genuine. I think they were quite genuine, but I think they were driven really by a political idea of what they wanted Europe to look like. Well, that's absolutely fine. Uh, but they, the one thing that that did make me think along, I suspect a lot of other people, is this idea that one size fits all couldn't really work in a crisis. And never mind a crisis, if anything, I kind of suspect that the single currency in the Eurozone has been derailed by Anglo-American neoliberalism. That's what's done it in. The total free-for-all of the bankers and, and the complete deregulation of the city and the, 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 the rush to the bottom, the globalised rush to the bottom. That's what's de helped destabilise the euro even further. So I kind of think that actually this whole issue of democracy goes to the heart of it, and that for too long people, not just in Britain, it's not just a thing in Britain, but across Europe too, have got, people have got genuine, uh, there's more than concerns, people are getting extremely worried, uh, and they feel that they have been told to believe this and told to do this and they no longer, and they're losing their democratic rights, they're having governments appointed, and that what they would really like to do is to, to actually decide what sort of relationship they would like to have as European countries. And if it is the case, as it appears, that two European unions are now emerging, then surely, as things, as, as histories and, and, and facts are created on the ground, then all the arguments of those people who are completely in denial and won't allow people to have a referendum um, really uh, should, uh, are, are really disappearing. Now, I do think that the public can't be wrong. If the public wants to have a referendum on Britain's membership of the European Union, for instance, down the line, 
then it should. And so I'd just simply say that I have been involved in something called um, the People's Pledge, which is the first cross-party uh, campaign for a referendum. And um, I hope it succeeds. And I hope that, they, that people do get a, a choice and do get to vote in a referendum on the European Union before, we, before the authoritarians take over. So thank you very much. Indeed. to speak and uh, also welcome such a large audience. So Christmas time, time for making wishes. Now I sometimes, as many a good dear Santa Claus letter will testify, sometimes these Christmas time wishes may seem, at first at least, a little like landish, a little utopian, as your children might tell you. Um, but uh, in that good seasonal tradition, I want to make my wish for uh, this Christmas, so my wish is, some may say it's quite landish, which is I wish to see a speedy dissolution of the Euro, and I want to see this as part of a new political, democratically infused campaign for a stronger united Europe. So an end to the Euro in the context of campaigning for a stronger Europe. Now first, it's uh, a little bit of good news, right? And as uh, Simon especially pointed out, there's very little good news we can really uh, <coughs> lat latch onto with anything to do with respect of the Euro. I mean, day by day, it seems that the possibility of a banking implosion and the consequences of that for an even deeper recession than is already on the cards for next year, uh, that ratchets up. But the little bit of good news I would refer to is what happened last Friday morning, because I think that breakup between Cameron and the other European leaders does make my wish a little bit easier uh, uh, to come true. Because whatever his motives, and I think we can probably all agree it was more by accident than by intention, what uh, Cameron did in vetoing was to make a tiny crack in that no politics, anti politics, technocratic regime which has characterized the whole life of the Euro, and in particular has characterized those uh, desperate uh, machinations of the past two years to try to save the Euro. Bringing politics to bear in the councils of Europe, whatever form that politics is, is today, and what happened last week therefore, represents a good thing in itself, in my opinion. What happened? You have a split between in some form, a political interest being expressed, in this case personified by Cameron doing that veto at 3 or 4 in the morning last week, uh, versus that uh, endemic tradition of bureaucratic Brussels stitch-ups, that sort of uh, detachment, that isolation from people, isolation from accountability, that bizarre attachment to process and uh, procedures, which uh, was epitomized, of course, in what we are told was the main outcome of the summit, which is this reinforcement of new fiscal rules to um, uh, sort of deepen the existing stability and growth path, which has been there, you know, pretty much since the, uh, since the beginning of the uh, 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 of the euro. So my argument is that in any such kind of position between politics of any form against technocratic process, then we must side with uh, the national politics. We must side with it because. Uh, what it represents is in some way bringing the discussion closer uh, to people. And that is what uh, it was so anathema to obviously the other uh, uh, representative there, but also this media tirade which we've seen over the last uh, five days against what uh, Cameron did. So I would add to my uh, initial uh, Dear Santa wish for a dissolution of the Euro, I would add the second parallel wish for more public politics and for no more uh, bureaucratic stitch-ups. Uh, I hope Santa would uh, listen to that one as well. To get back to my initial wish then, now for an end to the Euro, now as Simon has indicated, <coughs> to stand up and say you are against the survival of the Euro is somewhat of a taboo subject. Um, it has become 
the saving of the euro has become one of those TINA phenomena, one of those phenomena there is no alternative. Uh, and we've seen that right across the board. We've seen it not just from the Marcosis and the Sarkozys and whatever, and from the uh, Barrosos and, uh, and so on, not from those really in the inside of, the, of Europe. We've seen it from across the Western economies. President Obama has you know, increasingly or frequently stood up to say the biggest danger facing the American economy is the collapse of the euro and these headwinds which will come across the Atlantic to uh, buffet, the, uh, uh, buffet the American economy. And the reality is that until last Friday morning, and even in the case of Cameron, to be uh, balanced by Cameron, until last Friday morning in Cameron's veto, there was no Western leader, including Cameron until the few hours before, who in any way appeared to countenance anything other than giving priority and precedence to saving the euro. So, we're up against a bit of a, uh, a, a broad consensus, one can say there, in terms of my argument. Now, my argument is that the euro should not be saved, not because something has gone wrong with it over the last couple of years, not because of the, some impact of the neoliberalism liberalism and uh, the impact of the financial crisis over the, last, uh, over the last three or four years, that somehow it's become no longer uh, worth saving, that it's just you know, too much of a price to pay. My argument is that uh, because in its existing institutional form, its specific institutional form, the euro should never have been launched in the first place. And I think that's, the, uh, uh, that's where Mark is also sharing that perspective. The problems of the Eurozone are rooted in the simple, essential flaw at the Euro's heart, which is that you can't have a stable uh, currency union across economically and even countries without previously establishing a political union. It's as simple as that. In the absence of a legitimate, full-blown political union, and by that what I mean is one that has a popularly supported, solidarity-infused, uh, uh, transfer of resources from richer to poorer parts. Unless you have that, then the only way you can perpetuate such a currency union based on that real unevenness which exists, the only way that can happen is through the sort of austerity measures which have been imposed on Ireland, on Portugal, on Greece, on Italy and Spain, what measures known in the trade as internal devaluation. You don't have the opportunity to devalue your currency. The only way you can survive within a currency union is to push down your prices, mainly through uh, the acceptance of, uh, of cuts in wages. That's the only way you can make a pretense of addressing that competitiveness problem that Simon uh, talked about. So that means that the future for the weaker economies, the future which, in fact, uh, uh, Simon charted out there, can only be one of deflation and of prolonged slump. And I would stress that that would only be the price of sort of maintaining, in a sort of medium-term uh, uh, basis, a temporary respite to the consequence of that unevenness. Because that austerity, which was already being imposed and which we're being told there needs to be much more of, would not even address the underlying basis for the unevenness. It wouldn't address the competitiveness. It wouldn't address the productivity differentials, because that would require something much more substantial, which I'll go on to talk about. It would be pain without any real gain or real solution. So, my argument then is that the euro as presently constituted is therefore both undemocratic and also dysfunctional, and I'd argue it's irreformably so. Letting it go now through a collective decision to dissolve it would be the better and more progressive path to take. And despite all the obvious heavy legal, technical, practical uh, repercussions which, uh, uh, which, which Simon has talked about. Against all those fear of global catastrophe, what I would argue is that there are three signed, interlinked, and I'd say pretty much um, uh, certain benefits from the dissolution of the euro. Firstly, it would be good for democracy. Secondly, it would be good for economic growth and prosperity. And thirdly, it would be good for the prospects of creating a stronger united Europe. Run through those very quickly. Better for democracy. When the number one priority is seen, that everything has to take second place to defending uh, the euro, which is the, the, the perspective across the world, then that has become the justification for every further step taken in attacking popular uh, democracy and moving further and further away from the democratic uh, uh, possibility. <coughs> in traditional elitist fashion, the defense of the euro is seen, the defense of the euro is seen as one of those issues which is just too important 
too complex, too serious to allow ordinary people to have a say uh, on it and to express their opinions. As uh, Van Rompuy, the President of the European Council, put it, I think very succinctly around the time of the icing of Berlusconi, where he said that what Italy needs was reforms, not elections. Reforms, not elections. Which means we, in the European Commission, in the European Council, we know best, we will dictate what happens, and you Italians uh, should butt out of it and have no say in the matter whatsoever. That's the tendency. And that trajectory, anti-populist, antithetical to participation, antithetical to political accountability, is not going to reverse. We have to be honest with ourselves. It's not going to change. It can't be changed. It's inbuilt into the institutions and the constitutionality of this, uh, of this phenomenon. The ultimately unsoluble euro crisis then will see to it that because the stakes are going to get higher and higher as time goes on, we will simply see an escalation of that sort of attacks and those series of attacks on national sovereignty. And by attacking national sovereignty, it means attacking popular sovereignty too. So, a concrete way to challenge that anti-democratic monster that uh, Europe has become, I think, is to argue for the Euro be dissolved. Because the survival of the Euro is the main justification today for these increasing attacks on democratic rights. Secondly, why is it good for economic growth? I think three quick answers. Firstly, because it would mean an end to that sort of austerity and imposition of, uh, of cuts on the weaker economies that we've seen and we're seeing increasingly being, being imposed. And that is the exact opposite of what these economies need in order to reset themselves. And they certainly need it. These are broken economies. Uh, these are economies, just as uh, Germany, I would argue, is a broken economy, but these are broken economies that need to be reset. And the austerity measures are clearly taking those uh, states, those countries, in the wrong direction. Secondly, we should recognize that as the days pass, the prospect of a disorderly breakup of the euro is increasingly likely. And the reality is that an orderly breakup, a decision to dissolve something which is so clearly dysfunctional, would be in a much better position for us than a disorderly breakup, which would apply to be much more painful, much more chaotic, much more uh, uh, disruptive, and perhaps more importantly, or most importantly, also much more politically dangerous. Because a uh, breakup <coughs> caused by things which um, are, outside, uh, the, the, are, are uh, outside the control of those who should have some ability to create some control of this will actually increase the rem recriminations and the reciprocal accusations of blame to a level which will be much, much higher than it already is today. Uh, and that is, would be a very, very dangerous place for us to be in. Third economic reason and this is perhaps a more positive one, is I would argue that the euro has actually become a barrier, a roadblock, to these companies getting to grip with their economic problems. That it, the euro has become the means by which uh, these economies have survived. Now, I, I don't blame the euro, and none of us could, so chronologically it wouldn't work, but we don't blame the euro for the productive atrophy, the economic atrophy of uh, many Western European countries. We don't blame it for the high unemployment. We don't blame it for the uh, sluggish growth, which has been there really for 25 years. What we do blame, or what I blame the Euro for, is that it hasn't made it more difficult to actually resolve those problems, to actually address those problems. It's been a means through which uh, these societies have, in fact, denied the seriousness and gravity of the economic situation facing them. It's been a mechanism for the different local elites, the different national elites, to actually uh, uh, avoid <coughs> facing up to the seriousness of the problem. And that applies just as much to the stronger economies as it does to the weaker. We can all explain the way that uh, access to cheap credit for the Greeces and the Portugals and the Ireland's of, the, of this uh, the Euro world was able to maintain them at a higher level of prosperity artificially than it would be possible without uh, the low interest rates which the Euro tolerated and made possible. But the stronger economies, including Germany, have also been artificially boosted by uh, the euro because they have also been able to use it to avoid doing their restructuring. Remember, in 2002, Germany was a sick man of Europe. Even since then, productivity has been pretty um, uh, uh, unimpressive, like 1% a year since then. Germany is an appearance of prosperity because it has also benefited from its artificial creation of the euro. It's kept its currency much undervalued than it would have been if it was still for the Deutsche Mark, probably about 30%. It has also created this captive home market the rest of Europe, into which it can sell its goods. 
So on both sides, strong and weak, the euro has been a way of avoiding um, uh, uh, taking responsibility for addressing the economic problems. Because those problems are very serious, very deep-rooted. They need a very radical strategic restructuring of those economies, building up a productive base, which has been lost. And the euro in the past was an impediment to doing that. It was a cover, a protection, a way of comfort blanket to avoid doing that. Today, of course, it is a, a more obvious distraction from engaging in that sort of uh, restructuring. Move on to my last point as to why it's a good thing, which is I'd argue that the dissolution euro is good for the goal of a single uh, euro. It's good for the goal uh, of bringing that divide. And in fact, I'd argue it's a necessary step to take in order to be able to create a genuinely popular, uh, democratic, legitimate process of Europeans coming together. Why? Because very simply, for as long as the euro continues to exist, and all those measures, those intrusive, forceful, anti-democratic measures are continued, no one is really going to say a good word for Europe. Right? For as long as that happens, then it will sully and tarnish the whole idea of one union. Who spontaneously will say, I'm for this great Europe, when you can see the destruction, the anti-democratic <coughs> force and uh, use of, uh, 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 of imposition, and the uh, austerity, when that is all associated with Europe in so many uh, people's eyes. And every further bureaucratic action imposed in the name of keeping the euro going is only likely to further intensify the sort of internation tensions, the sort of conflicts, the sort of recriminations, the sort of ultimate rivalries which we are already seeing indications of. It's therefore, uh, I would argue, campaigning against the euro can both be a focus for and also a necessary precondition for relaunching uh, a rational and a beneficial goal of a single, at this time, democratic, this time politically accountable Europe. So to end, no Christmas cheer at this point, we are all in a very, very bad position. Right, whether we're in Europe, or Europe, and particularly when we're in Euro or out of the Euro. We are in a very tough place today. We have huge economic, we have huge social, we have huge political challenges. That is uh, uh, the reality of what's facing us. The euro as an institution, I'm arguing, and the coercive technocratic measures being taken in the name of defending it, are very, very substantial barriers for all of us inside the euro or outside of it in being better able to address those challenges. Trying to preserve the euro, I'd argue, I have argued hopefully, it's bad for politics, it's bad for democracy, it's bad for living standards, it's bad for the prospects of a uh, durable economic recovery, mm -hmm. and it is bad for the goal of European internationalism. The only way that things can change if us ordinary people get our heads together, and if we assert ourselves politically, and that Perhaps we can begin to discuss the question which uh, marks it up. Why are people not rising up against these uh, sort of obvious uh, uh, outrages going on? But to me, the focus for that, to me, the focus which is made slightly easier by that mess of the collapse and failure of the summit last week, what is slightly easier is for us then to be going out and take advantage of that to publicly campaign for the dissolution of the euro as it is presently constituted. So, <clears throat> so um, I want to go out uh, to take points and questions quite quickly. So I think I'll just throw one thing that's kind of um, I struggle to understand. Um, whatever the economics of it, and it is very complicated, lots of the economics of it. I think everybody can agree that the language in which the discussion is being had publicly <clears throat> over the last six months has changed. A number of you have reflected on. Um, the language of force, uh, which is being used more openly. Um, it does seem that the Europhile uh, position, and Simon, I'll probably start with you on this, the Europhile position seems to be that you're with us or against it, against us. You're either in favor of Brussels and a forced march towards fiscal discipline and austerity, or you're a little Englander uh, Euro-fascist, as I think Roger Cohen was calling uh, 
uh, how people who are skeptical about the, the euro people like Phil. That's going to little like with uh, euro fascists. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my left here. You don't have much of an option. You're one of those uh, two things. Um, but what I don't get. So your position, where you left us, was a collapse was made possible, but un unimaginable. Phil's not only imagining it, but wishing for it. Um, how do we not get you to agree, because uh, I don't want you to do that, how do we just understand it? Because you're saying, on the one hand, it must stay together, but on the other hand, because collapse would be unimaginable, right? But on the other hand, it's tearing itself apart because it's an imbalance of competitiveness, and there are national interests between France, Britain, and, uh, and Germany, if only those big three, uh, that seem irre irreconcilable. Just today, the governor of the French bank is saying, no, Britain, you should lose your AAA status long before us. <laughs> right? they're, they're throwing uh, these weapons around. Why would you want that lot to stay together? Mm. Well, I hope you're not cast by me as a Europhile on this panel. Uh, that would be a, a, a terrible mistake. Um, like. Um, uh, so yes, well, I, I um, I'm not a, an economist um, like Mark, but I um, I was at university during the Maastricht debates and set up my own little ma anti Maastricht ginger group. So I have uh, <laughs> so I have uh, long uh, so I, I, I painted my colours and Mark right there. And I I didn't um, I wasn't an economist at university, but I did I did understand I think intuitively or you know uh, well enough that. You couldn't have an economic and monetary union without political union, either sooner or later or eventually. And um, and as a result, I was I've been anti against Britain joining the euro ever since. Um, and uh, and so I've never it's never been I was never someone to support that. Uh, I've always thought that it was a um, the only way that this project could end was in either collapse or in political union. Uh, nothing in the last two years of writing about this extensively has changed my mind. Um, and uh, I also think it's possible to have a more nuanced position about the UK's role in, um, in the European Union. I think that uh, the Eurozone and the European Union are two different things. Um, so, uh, you know, I have, um, although I'm very much against Britain and the EU, never, never want Britain to join the Euro, and I hope and don't believe it ever will. Uh, I am quite ambivalent about, uh, I mean, I've, I'm much more um, open to the European Union. I think that actually the European Union has quite a lot to offer the UK, or at least in its current form. How do you reconcile the point that you're making? Well, I mean, I think that the, uh, I mean, I think my, my point is that I just simply don't believe that, uh, that, that there is in Bill's, you know, I don't accept Bill's view that there is an orderly way of breaking this up. I don't believe that you could get even uh, the, a small group of people in one country, let alone 17 countries, to start discussing how you would break this thing up without it leaking within hours and the banking systems collapsing within hours and the whole thing falling apart in a very disorderly way. Uh, I think it's, um, uh, I th it took two years after they actually fixed the exchange rates in perpetuity before they actually were able to introduce notes and coins into the Eurozone. Uh, they had to change, you know, to change all the ATMs and get the notes printed and distributed. And so, you know, trying to do that in reverse, there's no reason why it could be done any more quickly in reverse. It's still an absolutely logistical nightmare to try and introduce new notes and coins, for example. So it's, it, it's simply not, um, it's practically an extremely difficult thing. No, I don't think anybody can, um, if, there was some, if there was any other way around it, one wouldn't will this end to happen, if this thing to break down. I think it would... It would wipe out people's pensions, wipe out people's savings, it would lead to mass unemployment, and who knows what uh, political would come out of the ensuing political instability. This is, not, this is not a sort of throw it up in the air and let's see what happens kind of scenario that I think anyone should want to happen. If we're talking about trying to preserve democracy and preserve uh, you know, good governance, whatever, I think that, you know, that, uh, that we should start with the idea that actually that, uh, you know, that trying to try and maintain some degree of our uh, you know, prosperity and living standards is probably a good way to start. So, you know, I, I, I think that we should, so I think that, but having said that, you know, I made the point that, um, that governance, that the only way that this thing could be resolved is to solve this competitive, is to address the competitiveness issue, and that will require, eventually, 
fiscal transfers, either in form of debt relief or ongoing fiscal transfers between countries. And the only way you can have fiscal transfers between countries is if you address the governance issues I was talking about, which means that you have to have legitimate and disciplined rule-based systems by which those transfers can happen. And that, and, and, that, and that would have to be democratically achieved, it would have to be democratically accountable in some different way or other, and there are various different ways of doing that, but I think it can be, it possibly can be achieved, it it, it's possible that it could be achieved, but as I say, I see the, the, the philosophical issues between the players that are barriers to that, and I think they're very, very hard to overcome, but I just, you know, but, but they, the part of me that has three small children hopes that they do get overcome. Okay, so Mark, what's your take on it? Because um, <coughs> the nightmare scenario that, uh, that Simon's painting, oh, taxes going up, unemployment going up, wages going down, pensions going down, is arguably already happening in a large number of, of, of countries. And people are um, not really doing anything about it. Do you think people can? Uh, push open the door um, that Cameron may have inadvertently uh, opened towards a, a more public political debate? Um, yes, I think, of course they can, because um, <clears throat> we do still live in a democracy, and I suspect that because Britain remains outside of the Eurozone, there is a degree of room for manoeuvre that other countries may not have. <clears throat> and it's also quite possible that at the end of all of this, uh, a, uh, a sort of variant of the Eurozone, we're told, could, uh, could sort of survive around Germany and actually become um, quite powerful and there may be a future uh, when other countries might decide in a referendum to rejoin it. Who knows? But I mean, I think that the, the problem <coughs> we have got is one that in our dumbed down um, political culture that uh, so much of what passes for debate is raucous and strident and the people are very, it's very easy to put people into, into boxes. Uh, and for, it hasn't actually helped, I would argue, that you know, a lot of what you call Euroscepticism has been, um, really, I mean, it's, the, the, the running has been made by the Nigel Farages of this world, I mean, by people, people burning EU flags, and that, to, to, not total nonsensical stuff. But again, elements of the media would happily play along with that, because I think there is probably a degree of truth to say that you know, the, the, the mass media organisations of Britain, especially the public, the publicly owned one, the BBC, that is rather averse to uh, actually stepping forward and saying, well, hold on, there is another view. Um, I mean, you may find it sometimes in different forms of the media, on the internet and what have you, but that's, that has been the problem. So... I thought you would be in favour of raucous and strident debate. Well, I, no, no, but, but no, what, I, what I mean by that is that, you know, the only Eurosceptics can be flag burners. Um, or the UK Independence Party, and listening to Nigel Farage making ludicrous comments about Germany, insulting comments about Germany. I'm sorry, but the, the, there is a great tradition on the liberal left, not just only in Britain, but elsewhere, of, of, a, of a Euros, not to, towards Europe, but towards institutions. And exactly as you were saying, Phil, I mean, the, the, the whole argument of the Euro itself, what you were saying, would be regarded by the Euro establishment as being absolute heresy. But you don't sound like a heretic to me. And this is, this is, this is the problem I think we've got. Well, we'll go. come back in, but um, to Simon's point first, maybe, about is it impossible for the currency union to, to break up? And then please let me go at them on the politics. Of okay. <laughs> well, I think we might open it up to Robert's <laughs> strong debate. But no. I think the, impo the important thing to say is that, and what I try to argue, is that Europe isn't just sort of dysfunctional and it has been since, since its, its origin, but also that we've We've got to a stage where things have moved. You know, we sort of, we, we've gone across the Rubicon or whatever. We've gone to a stage where quantitative problems have turned into qualitative ones. And I can't see there's any turning back. I agree entirely with what you're saying, Simon. There are only two choices. Either you go to political union or it collapses. Political union means imposing on people who've had no say in the matter a full you know, transfer union. That you know, if one can countenance what that involves, that involves trampling on democratic rights, not just for the, you know, periphery of countries, it's trampling on the democratic rights of the German people. It would be telling the Germans and the Dutch and the, uh, 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 the Belgians and others who've got a little bit of money, Belgium haven't got too much, but it will be telling the richer uh, uh, taxpayers, you, who never voted for this, who never signed up for this, are going to have to pay 
um, in the same way that the rich states of the United States of America you know, pay for uh, those which are disadvantaged uh, and are uh, maybe recession hit in other parts of the United States of, you know, of, of America. That's what he's saying. You'll be trampling on the democratic rights of people across the whole of Europe if you get to political union. So you either, so it's, in fact, it's, it's, it's really three choices. It's either you impose that, which is on a scale of the denial of democracy, which you've never seen in, uh, uh, in peacetime ever, or it's going to create a reaction to that, which is then the stepping stone, or one of the possible mechanisms, by which it gets to your alternative, which is an implosion. So if you have only these two horrific choices, why not say, let us not just sit here and watch one of these two horrific rail crashes happen, but actually try to take control of the situation. And I would say, yes, there are lots of legal, lots of technical, lots of practical issues. You know, the ATM machines are going to be messed up for weeks and weeks, and we're not going to have this and that. But it is something we can actually deal with. You know, there have been much smaller, much less significant currency unions which have, which have, which have been wind up. You know, the you know, ruble union after the you know, Soviet Union imploded. You know, it was only a handful of countries and so on. But, but it did prove the general uh, 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 <coughs> historical m message I'm saying. Once you have no political union, then uh, uh, you can't really have a stable currency union. So the Soviets, after the implosion of Soviet, tried to maintain a, a ruble union. And after a couple of years, everyone left it because it just, wasn't, it just wasn't working. And Latvia, one of the countries that left, you know, it went through the process. It ex turned its lats into, or turned its rubles into lats at a one-for-one -one exchange ratio. Then a year later, it let it, uh, it, it let the the lat change its currency rate and so on. And in fact, for four or five years after that, it was doing pretty well economically. You know, it, it, there are small microns, so actually, these practical technical issues can be overcome. There's a good paper, which I'm sure Simon's read, by Barry Eichengreen, who's one of the main sort of currency experts, and. He wrote a paper in 2007 on what happens if the euro breaks up. And, that, and he goes through all the economic points, the technical points, the legal points, and so on. And interestingly, he says, actually, these are all very difficult, but they're manageable. The most difficult problem is the political one. Because he envisaged a scenario wherever one country would make the move to go out, and it would create a tremendous inter, uh, in, in international conflict. And I think he's right in saying that something which is done in that, uh, in that way um, uh, uh, is going to create much more problem than actually a controlled decision. Now, how that's going to come by, yeah, I'm getting a bit utopian, aren't I? But I'm arguing that if this could be a focus for political campaigning, not just saying in or out of Europe, but actually say, let's actually take a, a practical measure, argue against this institution for the reasons, and expand the reasons that, are, that, are, that I've given, and it's a way that people can begin to take control of the situation and perhaps you know, put a bit of pressure on those uh, insulated, isolated elites. You know, they may actually respond. Okay, I'll give the panel a chance to come back later on to questions, but I'm going to take um, a range of them now. Um, four, five, six at uh, a time, uh, points, uh, contributions as well. So start over there. And if you stand up and shout, because we are going to keep the mics up here. Because we're going to <laughs> okay, um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say how much I appreciated all the, the, the lectures tonight. I thought Simon was was quite right to talk about the, the competitiveness problems and Mark was right to emphasise the, the democracy problems. Um, in terms of uh, Phil Mullen's uh, uh, sort of proposal, I mean, it, it reminded me a bit of Mad Max or Saw, as in, so basically this bomb's going to go off to blow your head off uh, unless you're prepared to hack your own foot off very, very quickly. Uh, and it's, uh, so, uh, First of all, is that possible? And second, second, do we, do, do we have a hacksaw sharp enough that's fast enough? Anyway, that's that's, that's which is another point. But I would like to, to the, the panelists to talk about what they think is actually going to happen, rather than because we talked a lot about, about what would ideally happen. What? Do, how do you think this is actually going to play itself out? Okay, what will happen? Okay, see your hands again. You can kind of keep them up. Any on this side? None from the right hand side of the audience. Right. <coughs> in the middle. You, given given the, the, the choices between union or uh, the whole thing falling apart, basically, the, the elites which are at the centre are almost a separate beast of themselves and they're being pushed into a corner, maybe. And a beast in a corner is a, is a dangerous one. Okay, good. Uh, you and then. 
thank you. Um, just to let you know where I come from, I was a director of a major Roman investment bank for uh, 15 years, running European operations, particularly over the period we're talking about, with, uh, especially with Euro 12 mark, where you know, the, all of this change was happening, the Euro was starting to be debated. And um, I won't name any names, but um, uh, I was part of a team that visited Sweden and Denmark to help them vote no. So we're quite pleased with that. At the same time, um, also I put out, a, or I was just about to put out a large document um, about six months before the Euro was announced, suggesting, it wasn't all my own work, far from it, it was uh, my economic department, suggesting that certain countries probably in Southern Europe will bring it down within 10 years. So we're quite pleased with that. However, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I never saw the light of day. I've got a copy, by the way. Uh, I'll grapple it later. Um, but it never saw the light of day because um, my publishing department, um, it, we, they all go to the, the sort of board and the chairman. And um, the chairman rang me up. Uh, I was doing a marketing tour in Sweden at the time, and they rang me up. I was on the phone, remember it, well, in the taxi. And uh, very curtly, he said, um, would you uh, like to visit Frankfurt, please? I'd like to see you in my office tomorrow morning. So I thought, fine, you better see the chairman. And so I went up Frankfurt, up to the top of the Twin Tower, or one of the Twin Towers of the, this particular bank. <laughs> it starts with D. And, uh, <laughs> and saw the chairman. And he uh, said to me that, obviously, cannot do it. Cannot publish this. And I, for me, people that know me, I'm uh, pretty pig-headed. And he knew me as well, because I've known him for some years. And he said, um, before you resign, he said, um, <laughs> uh, I'll just tell you a secret. And so I could probably can tell you it now, and you can probably work out the names. But he said, um, I, I totally agree with you. This is a total pig ass. It doesn't work. Uh, the euro will fail. He said, however, unfortunately, the Chancellor has got a gun to my head, so therefore, I'm putting a gun to yours. Um, forgive me, but it just it has to be the case. Um, he knew that total honesty with me works, mm -hmm. and so I didn't design. I did hold it, and it didn't come out. But he did give me free reign verbally to say what I did. So, anyway, that, that's, that's, my, point. Sorry, that's my story. Okay. Forgive me of that. Um, anyway, so that's where I come from. Um, my point is, looking at your, um, Simon, your uh, story of the Christmas future, I wake up in the Christmas future and see one where we have two Europe. We've got a Europe that is dominated by Germany, France. There is some form of fiscal management going on where the Northern Europe pays the Southern Europe. It balances perfectly. If you actually work it out, the surpluses of Germany, um, particularly, but also of the Netherlands, work out almost exactly at the equal funding needed for Italy and uh, the Southern Europeans. It works, it balances perfectly. And indeed, you're right, Germany has mainly this decade grown from the sucking the growth from Southern Europe, not so, uh, most I have, I have to hurry a little. Therefore, that is, my, that is my first vision. Um, they have not solved the problem. They fudge it with buying a bond. I wonder if you agree with that. Versus the second Europe, Britain, uh, Sweden, which is still in Europe, but sort of partly out of it. It attracts 70% of all inward investment, as it has done for the last 10 years. Um, indeed, it is, it is now running the, uh, the Chinese yen, uh, and not yen, uh, the Chinese uh, currency, most of the uh, BRICS. Um, okay, so you have a question which one is like? Therefore, you know, essentially they are booming. Okay. Would so, you suggest that that vision one. has any thought in your world? All right, two possible futures. Yeah. Lady in front, can I see uh, hands? Okay, so I'll take you, so at the back, then you, then you. Carrie uh, from Aldright, a couple of quick questions. Simon, and, and I, I heard you before in a, in a debate agreeing with someone who referred to the Greeks as slackers, but it does seem to me that you consistently go along with the idea that we should take a hammering. And I'm wondering from all the panellists if, given there is a problem of lack of competitiveness and lack of productivity that needs to be solved, who do you expect to make sacrifices and pay price for that restructuring? Because it seems the Greeks would take an unfair hammering. And I would also 
I, from my understanding, it's true that, in fact, apart from a lot of nonsense that's talked about everyone retiring at 50 in Greece, which isn't true, and one of the lowest, uh, a third of um, UK income is the average about 800 euros a month, and that's with an increasing living standards. Um, but it's my understanding that, for example, Germany and France, in fact, in fact have never bled as a result of the IOUs being over leveraged and the extension of credit to countries like Greece. In fact, they've done very well off the interest, is my understanding, but the Greeks have got a hammering. My, my question for Mark is, the contempt you talk about for people, which we know is so widespread, how do we deal with that? And I think that part of that is seeing the British public as a lot of sort of Union Jack flag-waving, you know, anti-European, um, nationalistic nutters, when, you know, if there are some of those people, to be quite honest, at the moment, I wouldn't blame them, because I would see the EU and the Euro as a profoundly anti-European uh, institution, um, and something we do need, as Phil says, to get rid of. My question to Phil, very briefly, is you referred to the Euro, not the EU. Is that deliberate, or is that shorthand? Mm. <laughs> okay, and the gentleman at the back? Which one? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, ask Simon why he still seems to believe that some kind of third way is possible between full union on the one hand and leaving the EU on the other. Uh, what the whole business last week showed is that the European Union is still planning to impose the laws it wanted to impose, the directives, in any case. Uh, we now have a situation where Britain only has 8% of the votes in the major decision-making bodies, so we can't stop things such as the European arrest warrant and various other civil liberties threatening uh, measures. So surely the choice now is between accepting full governance from Brussels or on the, one or on the other hand actually leaving and uh, establishing the same kind of relationship that Norway and Switzerland have, a trading relationship, but we would be politically free to determine our own relationship with the world beyond the European Union, which is actually rather more important, given that Europe is in a state of economic and demographic decline. Okay, thanks. And then, you, I think, yes. I would like to make a point now for the Europeans. I'm a fervent European, and I've lived all my life. I've lived in Germany, I'm originally from Italy, and I've lived in here now since 1968. Now, I had a lot of talk here about Europe tonight. And to me, there's no new ideas. All I see is criticism, this, criticism, that. No new idea, no input. The Brits want to be in, want to be out. Get in and get contribution in it. Accept yourself, and you are good at it. Show the European what you can do. Don't criticize from outside. We were saying that about this city uh, tax, yes? Fine. Cameron doesn't like it. The Europeans want to talk to him. They, get, they were ready to say, look, you can have the tax that we collect from the city for England, for, for Britain. Doesn't that go into Europe? A lot of here is a lot of this statement that are not quite right. Now, Europe, what is this thing, Europe? Italy, what is Italy? Italy is 150 years old. And, and 150 years ago was 14 states. There still are 14 states. I come from Sicily. I don't understand the one who comes from Milan. <laughs> right? Now, what's the difference between Italy and the Euro? What's different in the UK? You've got Scotland, the Welsh, the English, the Irish. Oh, they all love each other. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Before it all picks up, can we just clarify that I think, I hope, almost all of us are pro-European. But it doesn't mean you have to be pro-the EU. People are making a distinction between those two things. But with that, I hope the war doesn't break out. I will take you. So. Well, it's a very quick point. So, uh, so we can I think it. we're intrinsically different to our European people. And uh, I think the goal... Do you goal, just just <laughs> <laughs> the goal, the goal in a famous quote once said that when Britain had to choose between Europe and the open ocean, it always went for the open sea. And I don't think that we're... Anything like the French or the Germans, or the and I think we would be far better outside the Union. And uh, you know that. Okay, I just say that.
I do like to have a bit of a from French tobacco. Kind of <laughs> but, um, there are some economic benefits to the single market. Right, I'm going to bring the panel in really quickly. Um, don't try and answer any or all of that. Uh, <laughs> just give a quick reaction to keep the, Not public. Keep the conversation going. <laughs> 30 seconds each. Mark, uh, Simon, then Phil. And then there's a lot more hands. It's very, very hard, but there's some, there's some really very, very good questions and points. And the point I would make is that so many of the supporters of the European Union always talked about federalism, and to me, that is exactly what we should be aiming for, federalism. We have federalism within the United Kingdom, they're devolved parliaments. And what we've seen is an accretion of political and economic power to the centre, and if anything is to survive, and we are to have international agreement amongst European countries and others, there has to be real... Uh, federalism. Who should pay the price? Well, clearly we know exactly who's been paying the price, and not just for the Eurozone crisis, uh, but for what has been happening these past few years, as the, over the past quarter century, as the massive gap between rich and poor has opened up, and there's no question that those who are paying the price are going to the stage where they're going to be refusing to pay the price, and that's why the head of the British Armed Forces can say that we actually face um, a greater threat from uh, uh, the economic um, uh, problems and military, uh, the military, uh, and the, the military threat, um, and I'd just like to throw open the potential because it's always there that as things become more unstable, uh, that uh, the, the, the idea of uh, of conflict uh, becomes rather more attractive to um, to those who would rather that we didn't they didn't have to address some of the deep seated social problems. And I've just I know we're not discussing it tonight, but the drum beats for Iran get ever louder. Simon, very quick thoughts. Uh, well, I really, really want to come back on Mark and Phil's points about democracy, but I've also got to answer some of these questions first. So, uh, but, um, so the first, uh, but I, I, yes, I don't think I used the word sackers about Greece, but I did I do think, but I do seem to remember that, comment, uh, that, that point of that discussion at the Battle of Ideas. And, and I think the point I was making then was, was the one you just made, which is that, uh, I mean, it's, it is without, you know, statistically quite clear that, that Greece was, you know, that the, 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 the Greece was paying less tax per capita and was working less hours per capita, that its public sector was being paid more per capita than, than most other countries in the Eurozone. But what is also absolutely true, and I think, and I've made this point in columns and in the platform many times, is that you're right, that so far in this crisis, <coughs> Germany and France haven't yet transferred or paid a single euro to these countries. They've actually made money out of the crisis. They've made money from their economic performance, they've made money from the interest on loans. And so uh, there's been no fiscal transfer. There's a, if there's been any fiscal transfer, it's been actually the other way. It's been from the countries that are in trouble to the countries that are, um, that, 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 that are, uh, to the countries doing well. And the, the country that has the most to feel aggrieved about is Ireland, which agreed under pressure from the European Central Bank not to actually uh, inflict losses on any of its bondholders in order to preserve the integrity of the European bond market and uh, is having to pay the consequence of that. It took an enormous hit for the Union and has not received anything in return. So I think Ireland has a very good reason to be, um, to be aggrieved. Uh, but I, and I think on the issue of um, you know, different types of Europe, different visions of the future, I mean, I, you know, I, I certainly think that, uh, that the UK and Sweden have done very well from their arrangement outside the Eurozone. I think there's a very, very big issue raised, uh, you know, which David Cameron's veto the other day has brought to the forefront of the debate, and, you know, I'm not sure, you know, I think it's the, whether it was cock-up or conspiracy, whether he meant it or he didn't mean it, you know, I think we can debate that, but I think he's brought, you know, the question, he's now definitely brought the question very much to the forefront of the debate as to whether we can carry on with that arrangement in the future. Uh, if the Eurozone survives, will we be able to carry on benefiting in the European Union Carrying on and join the single market. I, I, I don't know, but that is a valid debate. Leave it there, Phil. Um, Rob over there said enough of your fantasy uh, <laughs> ideas of uh, putting forward, you know, uh, outlandish political um, campaign points. You know, how is it going to work out? Well, on the issue of sort of forecasting, as you know, you're supposed to neither either give an event or a date, or but not both at the same time. So on the sort of timing of it, um, I think things could continue longer than people think. I think you know the, the history is that dysfunctional mechanisms and dysfunctional institutions 
always last longer than you know they rationally should. I mean, the American dollar, for example, is world money. Um, you know, stands out as being the world's biggest, the world's biggest debtor nation. Uh, you know, is uh, you know the the, the uh, currency that everybody wants to get into. I mean, you know, what's going on today in terms of the uh, dollar, even more than gold being you know the safe haven. You know, that will not last forever. But anyway, what I'm saying is dysfunctional institutions last long, and I think the euro also will, but I think it's therefore going to be pretty uh, bloody in a, uh, you know, not necessarily in, in a literal sense, but pretty barbaric in terms of what we're going to see. I think what's going to happen is I do not think the political union can be imposed. I think that is a step too far. So I take Simon's point, the point I have. You've either got imposed political union or you've got breakdown. Um, and at some stage it will be. I mean, I think next year, early next year, we've got the Greek debt crisis coming back again. I mean, Greece has been sort of off the agenda a bit in terms of the, the, the discussion. It's more been on Italy and been on, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, goings on between uh, uh, Brussels and Paris and, uh, and, and Berlin and so on. But I think, so I'm correct, I think the next big tranche of refinancing that Greece has to do is in, is in March. And I think if they don't uh, get uh, some things in place in the next few weeks, I gather, then uh, it's going to be very difficult for that refinancing to take place. So I think, you know, that will be the next sort of uh, little thing <coughs> going up again. But I think probably they'll keep uh, working through things for longer than we think. But in the end, it can't survive. It can't work out in a, in a nice way. Okay, so I'm going to try and run this way. There will be lots of people wanting to get in. So if you can make your points or questions kind of sharp and concise, and hopefully we can get you all in. And I'll just bring the panel in uh, for final thoughts at the end. So if you so, and then you, and then we'll move along that road in the white shirt, and then Tara. Um, just, just a question about philosophy, I guess. How far has this crisis been exacerbated by an absence of a sense of purpose amongst the elite themselves? I mean, is this the inevitable playing out of the absence of the subject in politics? that the political elite themselves seem to have no sense of purpose and no sense of direction. And in a way, is both of the, both of the options being presented, either an orderly default, a disorderly default, or managed austerity, or three of the options, sorry, um, are they themselves uh, just another straitjacket? Are they just another series of external uh, contingencies being imposed on the subject? Or, you know, is there, is there another way? Okay. That's kind of, you can't save Europe if you don't know what it's for, Western, so didn't you, sir? Yeah, um, my question was... Stand up, please. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Do you, think, do you think that the way that the future of Europe is being discussed, and is, I see it as being very technical, very complex, very financially difficult, um, do you think that's confused people? A bit. And therefore, when democratic governments have been pushed aside in Greece and Italy, people have been a bit unsure about why that they haven't been as angry as otherwise would have been, because it's to do with the euro, and it does seem to be a very difficult subject to understand. Okay. Right, and then the show at the end of that row, Well, I mean, I've been very busy recently trying to get a job and make, make ends meet, I'm sure everyone else has here, but... I recently on the on the YouTube I started watching is it Nigel Farge or whatever yeah and actually he's not that bad <laughs> he stands up and he says you know things like you sir how can you get paid more than President Obama when you're entirely elected of course and then and uh, it's this Barossa guy who said well I'm elected in secret ballot you know um, of course it's all that sort of nonsense so I just wanted to know what the panel the panel thought of him and really very good good question and then yes you. Uh, Tara and the Great, and then Barbara um, Well, I guess I would like to know what the panel think, because it's relevant both for the kind of apocalyptic scenarios of the disorderly breakup and also Phil's more positive argument in favour of the democratic benefits of the breakup of Europe. I mean, what, uh, what is, does anyone know, because I genuinely can't really work it out, what about the uh, public will in countries such as Greece and Ireland? Because I say I do not see actually, despite their problems in Ireland or Greece, that there is actually a desire to break free from the Euro, from the Euro or the Eurozone. It seems to me, from what I've read about Greece, that actually that seems to be almost more of a fear than, uh, 
the imposition of austerity. So just to know what the panel think about actually the pub, the real public will in those countries. There, and then we'll loop around. So James. The, I think the, the exclusion of um, real <coughs> democratic input into the whole European project um, pretty much over the last 10 or 15 years is one of the reasons why we're in the uh, state we're in. I think it's not just that we're trying to preserve democracy in some abstract way, but without proper democratic pressure and debate, it is really left to that kind of nice group of nice people around Brussels with their four degrees and their eight languages, who all know each other, uh, and who are all engaged in this kind of internal discussion, in this very timid, cautious, kind of piecemeal, <laughs> kick the problem down the road away. And that will just carry on. I think Phil's right, you know, that as long as they're left to their own devices, they will be continually trying to get their mate in charge of Italy and their other mate in charge of Greece and so on and so on. That's basically what's happened. And, you know, if you know them, they're very terribly nice people, but they're really lacking in the kind of imagination that's needed to solve this problem. And that can only come from outside of that process. That's why democracy is so important, because otherwise nothing's going to change. And I think, you know, we, we, we obviously here in this country can't really influence what the countries in the Euro do. But what we can do is, uh, as Marx and others have said, is campaign for a referendum on the whole European project. Because we do need to have much more of a public <coughs> debate, much more input from more people, much more anger being expressed. I was, I was quite encouraged by the opinion poll, actually, that uh, you know, the 62% Because otherwise it would have been, as people say, the wrong people clapping. It would have been just that small minority of rather objectionable right-wing Tory MPs. But actually there's a general feeling in the country that something's not right. That needs to be given much more public expression. Good, so quick, fast, furious points. I'll take um, you and then Lady to your right, so Tony, and then you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just thought that we should remember that there are some uh, coherent tendencies in Europe, despite all the disintegration. So long as we can bash India at the Durban climate change talks, uh, we'll unite on something. And I wondered whether Phil would like to clarify his remarks on European internationalism, since uh, our hostility to the Chinese, to the Indians, to the Americans, uh, and anybody who doesn't agree with us, uh, is uh, still a unifying uh, tendency, modified though it is by the centrifugal one. Yes. Um, I was just going to ask, in terms of what is going on within Europe now for a country like China, what would you advise to this? and business leaders as the smart thing to do now. <laughs> 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 I'm going to take a couple, couple more here and then go this way. If people want to give the lecturers some help in answering these questions, uh, please feel free, because there's no way that they're going to address these at the end. So, Tony, and then... Yeah, it relates to James's point, and uh, I wanted to perhaps give you a bit of a hard time as well, Angus, about saying, I, I assume we're all very <laughs> European here. Um, because I think that, uh, Phil, you've argued that we need a political argument for a political debate about political union in Europe, which kind of begs the question, why? You, know, you, you make the assumption, and I think you make the assumption in your article this week in CTM, that it's an obviously good thing. And I think, in a way, actually, this debate would be a lot better, and any referendum and debate around the referendum would be better, if we start a debate about what Europe has got to offer the world. I can think of a lot of things that Europe's got to offer the world uh, that are positive, and a lot, some of which have been brought up tonight, that are very, very negative. And so I think there's a question about what Europe's got to offer the world. There's also a question about uh, whether that is best served through a political union. I don't think it can be assumed. Okay, so very, very quick, that's a good question now, I sort of like the yeah. EU and I sort of don't, but I do like my savings. And <laughs> <laughs> I do like my savings, and some things on Newsnight I'd just like to bring up, because this week's Newsnight has been quite fascinating. I thought I heard Paul Mason basically say the other day that savings are just going to go down to swan. You can think it's your 85,000, you know, nobody will be able to support the losses, which slightly worries me in terms of what you said. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, there's a real sense this week that all economic theories about maximising profits, the real fault is we've got no theory of minimising debt especially maintaining social cohesion. So I just wondered what the 
Yeah. Uh, very good question. So I'll take Daniel here and then General behind you and then yeah. uh, Well, just to focus very briefly on Germany, because I think to understand what's going on, it is useful to focus on Germany, given it's right in the center of the whole thing, both <laughs> geographically, politically, and economically. Uh, because if you look at, from the perspective of the German elites, you can see why they really, really like the Eurozone. Because rather than go through the difficult task of restructuring their domestic economy, uh, as Phil said, what they did was keep their currency relatively low so they could export globally. They had captive markets in uh, Greece and Portugal, so they were effectively subsidising to buy their products. From, so from the perspective of the German elite in the short term, they like the Eurozone, just like the elite across Europe. They like the Eurozone because they could avoid tackling their difficult problems uh, and create a kind of short-term mini-boom from it. But from the perspective of ordinary Germans, that was not the case at all. Because what happened to average wages in Germany over the past 10, 20 years? They basically stagnated. You've had uh, severe cuts in welfare benefits in Germany as well over the last few years. So from my perspective, what I draw from that is that we have much more in common with the ordinary person in Germany, in Germany and for that matter France or Greece or wherever, than with a very small clique of technocrats which control the European Union and which the uh, political class in the, in the West just kind of goes along with because it doesn't have any, any other alternatives. We have much more in common with them than with the technocrats, whichever nationality they come from. Okay, thank you. So, you sir, and then, yeah. yeah, my point was uh, very similar to the gentleman over there who put it much more uh, beautifully than I was going to, but basically I wanted to ask the panel what their uh, position, what, what, why the EU, basically, in political sense, why the political EU? Okay, take those, then Claire and um, I think Phil's um, idea that there's no possibility of imposing a political union is probably, you know, not, not really quite right. I, I would argue that if you look at the political culture that exists across Europe today, it's one where, you know, people are prepared to accept the expert across a whole raft of areas of their lives, whether, you know, social policy, education, health, sex, diet, you name it. <laughs> the rise of the expert has sort of, you know, uh, been relevant to people's lives and they accept it in a very, very serious way. It's not a joke to think that, that that's not the case, that is the case. Uh, and in that sense, you know, uh, democracy uh, doesn't mean the same thing to people today uh, uh, at the end of a kind of political cycle, you know, where trade unions and social groups of all kinds, political parties, are, are much less effective than they ever were in any time in history. And so, you know, there may be problems, of course, yeah. I'm mean, not saying it's going to be easy, but I can't see why an appeal to democracy in this climate is going to make any great headway. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I think that's an excellent point. I mean, <coughs> force can overcome democracy. So, Claire? Uh, yeah, um, a slightly similar point, and maybe not for the panel now, but just to sort of for us to be thinking about going forward. I mean, one of the things that I have a problem with is that I want to emphasize how serious the times we live in are. But there is a danger with this EU discussion, by the way, that we also do sound as though we are one scam of it. And there's an awful lot of language of Armageddon in everything else. And, you know, everything from the climate uh, change discussion to, you know, what will happen if we get swamped by immigrants or any number of things. And there always is this danger how we balance up what is really serious times and uh, not frightening people. And I noted that, that <coughs> Phil, you slightly tempted by saying, well, probably not a lot might happen for a while. Um, which, uh, you know, but, so I do think we just have to be nervous of that. One thing is definitely the case, though, is, is that economic, there is not very much familiarity with having a serious economic conversation in the UK because it's as though the economy has become a technical matter and it's far removed from politics. So the number of people you talk to just say, I don't really understand the economy. And I do think as well that when we talk about, uh, somebody just made the point about democracy is not well understood. We also don't want to get into a situation where we, where we actually say we can't discuss the, econ the economy because we don't understand it, because we see it only uh, uh, technically. So that's something that needs to be done. And the final thing is, is that um, I slightly get nervous about the, uh, in the discussion in the UK, is, is that we can discuss the EU and all the things we talked about tonight, and I found the lectures really useful. But what we don't do, and sometimes this discussion doesn't help, is to actually talk about what, a pot, what would make the economy come alive, not just in Britain, not just in, in, not just in Europe, 
but more generally, how we resolve the economic crisis. But what none of us have talked about tonight is the need for economic growth, why there's no investment in R&D, and so on and so forth. So I wouldn't want the Europe discussion to be way of having that broader, uh, more economic discussion. Good. Um, Pete, you can see frantic hands will take a couple more after Pete, so, all right, these three here. Um, it's, it seems to me that Cameron, Cameron's veto has sort of shed a light on sort of rivalry between you know, Britain and parts of America, which some of you described very well. I'm not saying Germany very well. Um, but I'd like to ask the panel, do they see a limit to particularly the, the French and German um, rivalry? Because on the one hand, you're presenting as, as rivalry, a real living rivalry potential to, to spill over, but at the same time, we're calling them Mercosi. Um, and it seems to me that that's a tension. Um, and the limits to this will be the rupture of that, at the moment, arrangement, which they are, they have a very distinct interest, which are expressed through argument of the extent of the ECB or fiscal union. But on the one hand, they seem to be <coughs> just central tension, yet at the same time, they seem to be in bed together, slapping each other on the back, and, the, uh, and they call Marcosi. So will that get resolved? Will that tension get resolved? Or will the rupture happen? Well, people think about that, there are internal tensions as well. Not all Germans agree on something, uh, and not all the French, I mean, there are opposition within the country. Uh, and the French already said they'll renegotiate the, the deal if um, the socialists get elected. So, both the back and in front, and then I think that'll be last thoughts, and I'll bring the panel back in very, very quick. Um, just a question to Mark, as a fellow Labour man. Um, with the likes of President Obama, um, the then Gordon Brown, and where I, where I live, uh, Julia Gillard in Australia, we're seeing like a lack of leadership from the left. So, as a Labour inside man, as a Labour inside man in Australia, is this the end of the political left in this in this crisis? The left not always equated to Labour. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, mine is also a question for Mark. It's a very simple question. Um, with the People's Pledge calling for a referendum, how how would you word a referendum that would not then polarise the debate in in, the, in exactly the way that we are all trying to avoid? Okay, oh, yes, one last yeah. quick thought. In terms of the political issues, do you think democracy can ever topple technocrats? Yes. 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 <laughs> I hope so. Yes. Mark, yes. you're going to say yes, but in addition, say, you know, 60 seconds of other thoughts. I mean, we'll don't try and do it all because we'll continue in the pub. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, well, of course, democracy can. The technocrats who. Who have, who have suddenly been appointed have got a remarkably short period of time, I imagine, to, 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 to prove they, they know what they're doing. I think this, this possibly explains the kind of shock and, uh, and awe, if you like, and, and people sort of standing there not quite knowing, but also protesting very vigorously in countries like Greece. Um, without sort of, I think that the, the blinkers are coming off and people are beginning to, people are beginning to see the, 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 the reality around them. And I don't think that this whole idea that... Um, uh, you know, dem the dem democracy is in trouble uh, because the social institutions, the unions, uh, all the rest of it, the weak, means that that's going to be the case forever. And we know from the uh, polling in, in this country alone how strongly people feel. And that feeling must get stronger and stronger the more people are denied. And it goes back to your question about, I mean, I agree that the left isn't about social democratic parties per se. It's about uh, something much broader than that. And if, if established, Social democratic parties in the countries you mention are failing so utterly dismally. And you look at Europe, and there's only one uh, social democratic government, I think, in Denmark. Then there's going to there's going to be a, a, a new uprising, new political developments, new changes. So I'm not, you know, just because these political parties are failing, we need to preserve them in aspect. Um, God, where do you start? Um, no, 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 very, last, very word, very, last word, last word, last word, what is my last word? Yes, I tell you what, my last word is this, last few words, I think. Because we keep on being asked about solutions, and I mean, there are a multi, I've talked very, very briefly about uh, federalism, um, I, I, and, and that as opposed to, to centralisation, but there are clearly, we have been <coughs> offered a model, essentially, that you either have the technocrats in power, or it's the authoritarianism of Russia and China, and there's nothing in between. But there are models that are actually working quite well, and there's been mention made of countries such as Latvia, Lithuania, these are small countries, like Switzerland, Norway. I just spent a week in South Korea, a country that has a very powerful uh, economy, where there, is, there has been some divide between rich and poor, but essentially it's a post-dictatorship democracy that's doing rather well, and like Taiwan too. These countries aren't tied into a, a centralised um, 
uh, system. They haven't given up all sorts of democratic powers and economic powers to do that. Um, there, there is a sort of a model of sorts there. Well, I have to say, the idea that, um, that Britons would work as hard as South Koreans getting up at yeah. 7 in the morning and coming the same that I'm not saying that But there, there are some answers in these countries too, I think. Oh, come on, go on. I mean, the Britons aren't slackers now as well. Right? <laughs> 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 okay, um, on some of the quick fire questions, yes, I'm against the EU uh, as well as the Euro, just to that. I am, yeah, I'm for European integration. I'm for. United States of, uh, of Europe of some form. I'm not, I, I see your point, James, about Euro chauvinism and fortress Europe and stuff, but I don't think that's our problem today. I think the problem, that may be a problem sometime in the future. And I'm pleased that, you know, somebody, it wasn't me, so that Mark raised the issue that there is, you know, half of the world which is, you know, doing pretty well at the moment in terms of Asia. And it's precisely in that context that we have an international world economy. And I think there is no way that you cannot um, uh, uh, but see that a uh, 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 an integration of the 500 or so million people in 30 countries across Europe is a progressive thing in the sense of being able to both reflect an already quite developed international division of labour and be, could be able to facilitate that, take that forward, so that Europe could play a role alongside South Korea and alongside China and alongside the more dynamic parts of the world to, in fact, offset this declinism which uh, uh, people have commented on because I don't think it's inevitable that Europe should decline. I think it will decline if it carries on in the way that it is at the moment, but it's not inevitable. And that's, I think, my main point, which is to say, you know, there is just too much fatalism and too much acceptance of the inevitable. And um, when you have problems, and it's not about saying, oh, I'm trying to sort of sugar the pill or so on, because I do think things are pretty grim, I'm so afraid to say. I do think, you know, our savings could all go, you know, when we go to the banks after Christmas. It could happen. <laughs> Generally, things take longer than that. But what I think we have to do is rational... Democrats who do think that democracy can prevail over technocracy and over, over bureaucracy is that we say, well, let's try and do something about it. Let's not see a grim condition as being a reason for delay or procrastination or just letting things drift, which is the main characteristic of the elites today. The elites' reaction to problems is to muddle, is to attempt to muddle through and to delay and to procrastinate. I think our rules start to say that is actually making things worse. So let's not accept the inevitable working its way through, but have faith in ourselves in being able to direct the future in some way which will be better than simply letting things fall apart. Okay, and Simon, you really do have the last few Yes, I've been waiting ever since Mark <laughs> finished speaking to get back on his point on politics. I think Luffy has some very good points raised on the floor, which, you know, lead nicely. But I, I really, you know, I, I can't share in this sort of general hand wringing about technocracy and lack of democracy and so I mean you know clearly the EU has a democratic deficit but let's be clear these um, these te these technocratic governments in Greece and Italy are constitution they are allowed for under the constitutions of Greece and Italy they have been they only exist by the support of the Greek and Italian parliaments Berlusconi could pull the rug on Monti tomorrow if he wished to he still has a majority in parliament uh, the, the Greek uh, Passov could pull the plug on Papadimos tomorrow if he wanted to. So this, this is, these, are, these, these governments in these countries do have a parliamentary legitimacy. They, have been, they are supported by parliamentary democracy. Elections have not been suspended. There will be an election in Greece in the first quarter of next year at some point. And uh, the Italian government can only last until 2013. There have been it, uh, technocratic governments in Italy in the past. And by the way, they've achieved... Actually, anything that's been achieved in Italy in the last 30 or 40 years <laughs> will only ever be achieved. Right? <laughs> and I think that there's, a, <laughs> I think there's, a, I think there's, a, no, I think, and also I think there's a, another important point, which is that, uh, you know, that if, if uh, that there is no sign in many, of, in pretty much any of these peripheral countries where the debt crisis is its most severe, uh, there is big demands to leave the the euro. The, the euro. The protests in Greece, I didn't go to Athens, but whereas my colleagues did, but my understanding is that the, a lot of the protests in Greece was actually anti-politician, was anti the political class. There's dreadful political class in Greece that has held sway over the country uh, for so long that they felt, you know, that why are these people the ones making decisions? I think that actually a lot of, that a lot of parts of Europe and have been very badly governed over historically. They've been uh, uh, democracy. Uh, we all are Democrats, we all believe in constitutional democracy, but the reality is that a lot of these countries, and Italy is a classic example, have not been well served by their politicians, and that, that, that we do have a sort of crisis of democracy in these countries, in the sense that we've had 
politicians who have made promises that simply cannot be delivered on, and they're never going to be delivered on. And if the countries fall out of the euro, the same politicians will still run these countries and will still make policies that uh, promises that can't be delivered. And these countries will get poorer and weaker and more unstable. So there is no simple panacea that says leave the euro. Just why these people in these countries don't want to leave the euro? They see actually they see in Europe and in the European Union actually a, a antidote to the deficiencies of their own political of their own political class. They look to Europe for better governance. They hope to get it. So I think that we should be careful about um, trying to <coughs> trying as us as Brits who pride ourselves on the greatness of our, on our brilliant governance that, that to try and impute onto them our own anxieties about our own democracy. And I think I must make this point about Brussels as well. And, and you know we, we must be clear also that you know that every single decision that um, gets made in Brussels is not made by Barroso and his technocratic elite. It's made by the European Council and it's made by and it's voted and it's voted upon by European Parliament and, and everything then has to be passed into UK law via our own Parliament. So there is a degree so there is a democratic uh, legitimacy through the process of EU legislation. And of course there is a there is a you know there is there is an issue around the fact that only the, the unelected commission can initiate legislation in the European Union. But the reality is that the legislation that comes out of Europe is democratically, there is a democratic legislation to it. And it may not be perfect, it's probably not sufficient for the kind of fiscal and political union that is going to become, that is going to come forward. And my conversations with people around Europe, there's a recognition of that. That's part of the tension that's going on. But I do think that um, we should be careful when we talk about this political union. A lot of the political union that is needed to run a, the, an economic and monetary union will, if these treaty changes go through and be agreed, most of, the, most of it is already in place. There is an issue around then creating a greater political legitimacy, but I think we should be careful about getting ourselves into a position where we think that there is, um, that, that this democratic deficit is, you know, that we're being run by unelected technocratic elites. Our democracy is still strong in Europe. And countries still, people still do have votes. They still, there is still referenda if there is going to be a treaty change. So I think that we should, we should, no, I would like to just end on that slightly more optimistic note. Okay. Well, we can debate whether or not that's optimistic, but can we take the panel first of all? Give me two minutes before we all leave, because obviously this crisis is going to uh, continue. Uh, the democratic deficit is there, whether you think it's on the side of the EU or on the side of us. Uh, we need to debate that. If your savings are going to go, <laughs> there are three places you need to put them. First of all, with Tom and Vivian at the Newham Bookshop, take advantage of their 10% off. Not that it will make much difference. And educate yourself to a degree in political economy and find out what's going on. Secondly, join the IOI, because we will argue this on our own. I, mean, I think we're a bit like um, the ex-Chelsea captain Dennis Wise, who, who uh, Ferguson said of him he could start a fight in an empty room. <laughs> but we will do that, but it'll be a lot more interesting, entertaining, and profitable uh, if you get involved. So join uh, the IOI, come to the academy to debate freedom. Uh, this summer and the battle of ideas to debate freedom, uh, equality and what's happening in Europe next October. Thirdly, give some of those savings to the pub we're going to now, which is called The Rocket. Out of here, that way towards King's Cross, on the corner on your left hand side, where we can go uh, and sacrifice some economics to continue debating politics for the rest of the evening. So see you there and thank you for coming.